Hey, good people. Welcome to Text Request Talks, where we have conversations with business leaders about how they make things happen. Presented by Text Request, the business text messaging platform that lets you text from your office phone number directly on your computer or any other device so you can stop making phone calls and start actually getting responses. Learn more at textrequest.com. I'm Kenneth Burke, and today's guest is Libby Lossing, who's a franchise owner of 14 Mathnasium locations. Libby, thanks so much for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So just kick us off, just in your own words, can you explain uh, what exactly it is that you do and why of all the things that you could possibly spend your time on, did you decide to go into this profession? Yeah, so I am a multi-unit franchise owner with Mathnasium, the Math Learning Center. Mathnasium is an after-school K-12 learning center where students go for math tutoring and enrichment, homework help, and test prep services whenever they're done with class. I am actually a second generation franchisee with my family's ownership team. So my parents founded their first location whenever I was getting ready to head off to UCLA for college. And I had a great appreciation for what my mom was starting to build. I got to go to a lot of conferences with her, the annual Mathnasium conventions, whenever I was still a student at UCLA. So I got to love the brand on my own terms. My mom, she was a former educator. She had a business degree. My dad, he retired from like the C-suite level of corporate retail. So they had their own like business expertise. And obviously as a college student, I didn't necessarily have work history, but I really love the brand. I really love the results of the brand. And it's something that I felt really great about. So whenever I graduated from UCLA, I expanded our brand into our second state. And then my brother followed suit and expanded into our third state. And then I went ahead and said, it's my turn again. So we expanded into a fourth state. <laughs> I love that. Uh, how you as a family have been in this for so long. Do customers or students who need tutoring, uh, are they just coming in entirely by word of mouth now? Or what do you do to actually bring in customers? Yeah, it's really fun that since we've we've been doing this for over a decade now, so it is really nice whenever referral and word of mouth and just good customer testimonials and your brand reputation speaks for itself. Um, it's really awesome that a lot of our former customers become employees because the student who at one point really struggled with math as maybe a third or a fourth grader, we help them repair that relationship with mathematics build their confidence in school. They went on to be the straight A student and be in the honors program by the time they're in high school. And then they wanted to come work for us whenever it was time for them to enter the workforce because they had such a great experience. So it's cool that now that we have a decade under our belt, we've had multiple people go from being customer to being employee and then promoted to manager. Um, it's not an uncommon story anymore, but it's, it's really nice. And those people I mean, they're the ones that are really singing our praises to their neighbors, their younger siblings, their younger siblings' friends. Um, so it's been really great because we keep breaking our, our own ceiling for ourselves. Like we used to think that having 100 students was amazing, which don't get me wrong, it is. But then it was 120, 150, 175, 200. And now it's more like in the 300s, we're like, yes, <laughs> we're doing something amazing. Something I wanted to ask you about anyway is, is how do you approach hiring? Because especially as you grow uh, a brand and expand into multiple locations, you need more tutors, more teachers. Um, so I guess what tells you that those former students are going to make good tutors as well? Or what do you look for when you're hiring? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a convenience to people who understand us and understand our curriculum and understand the temperament that makes a good instructor, especially when they were a former student. They know which instructors they cling to the most. Like if they get to walk in the center and they see that John's working, they're going to go sit by John and they know the reasons why. So it's really great for them to understand that patience is so essential when working with a child, especially a child that might not necessarily enjoy school and whenever they go to mathnasium after school it's like they feel like they're being punished initially and they just have to learn that we're here to be a help to them we're here for their benefit so the really patient instructors the ones that can kind of build rapport right out of the gates with students you look for the people with those really great soft skills on top of the people who know math we have a literacy exam to make sure that they know mathematics at least through algebra two um, 
but to make sure that they have the soft skills and the right personality and the right temperament to really work with kids um, is critical for our instructional staff. Whereas for managers, to be a manager of a mathnasium is such a multifaceted role. You have to have a strong understanding of sales, team leadership, um, education. So it's really hard to assess for that during an interview. We have to go really resume heavy to make sure that they have enough transferable skills from other industries. And then Mathnasium as a franchise has such a robust training program that within hopefully the first six months, our center directors are ready to be fully self-sufficient. Since we've been in this for a decade, we've gotten really great at team building. So fortunately, we get to um, transfer a lot of our employees from one location to another. So they get a lot of great experience as either an assistant manager or a lead instructor at one location. And then whenever a position arises at another location, either the person who's number two there is ready to move up or we're able to transfer someone from a different location. And we've done that across states as well. We've transferred people from San Diego to Phoenix because they're young and they're looking to move and establish a family of their own in a new state. So we've just been really lucky, but our tenure is really great. I wanna say our retention for at least upper level management, which is the hardest position to hire for. Most of our people have been with us for more than two years at this point. So really lucky on that front, knock on wood. <laughs> <laughs> So tell me a little bit more about the operations of this, because I'm really curious and, you know, how you, how you make things happen. So um, whenever you are expanding into a new territory, um, how, how do you decide who's going to, to lead that new location? How do you um, bring in new employees for that location as well? Cause I imagine, you know, you want to keep good people where they currently are. You don't want to have to move them if you can uh, help it. Um, so how do you, how do you find those, that personnel? And then, you know, it's a new market. So how do you bring in new customers fairly quickly to, to make it profitable? Yeah. I mean, for the most part, it comes down to good storytelling, uh, because I really love what my family's done as a family business. Um, I love our reputation. I love our results. Um, we have a lot of accolades that we kind of like to Put at the forefront of anything we're doing so whether we're establishing a new location that you're starting with a customer base of zero and maybe mathnasium hasn't been in that city before so they're not as familiar with your brand as a city that's more saturated with our locations um it just comes down to hoping that they trust that the success we've had in other markets will be able to bring and repeat in their area we just expanded into denver so this is our first year in the denver market and we've done a lot with like local press as far as telling the stories of like the past decade and how we have a top 10 learning center location for Mathnasium, how my mother won the franchise business reviews, franchise business rock star this year. Um, just different little accolades like that, Reader's Choice Contest. We've won numerous employer awards. We're a top workplace in all of our cities. So being able to like kind of pull those talking points and express them through our social media, our news interviews, our email marketing campaigns, um, our badging and our signatures of an email, all of those little things just to try and reinforce. We might be new here, but this isn't our first rodeo, and we approach business ownership with a lot of confidence. We do the same thing in our Indeed postings. like It's all over our Indeed company pages, so that way people know that this might be a new facility, but you're going into a business that has a lot of experience and a lot of expertise. And there's obviously room to grow because we have success stories from our other management teams. So Indeed is a primary hiring site to answer your original question. Indeed, whenever you're looking externally, we also use CareerPlug as one of our vendors. So CareerPlug will post to multiple job sites on our behalf. And we just log into the career plug portal to kind of manage whether they came in through ZipRecruiter or a different resource. Um, but it allows us to look at all of our candidates in one place. And it's just more of a convenience as a multi-center operator. Um, but we've, we've been really fortunate with who we get in terms of candidates. Also, we, we're pretty competitive in how we compensate. So that helps a lot too with getting, getting applicants because I would say pay is probably number one. So between our compensation and benefits package, 
uh, we're pretty quick to fill roles. I want to say it took us less than two weeks to fill all of our management positions whenever we opened three Colorado sites um, this year. How do you keep up with customers ongoing or how do you get them to keep get the students to come back? Because I'd imagine it's something that would be pretty easy for a student to come in and have a session or two with you and then um, possibly feel demoralized because to your point earlier, it can feel like a punishment when you're starting out. Um, instead of uh, something to help you on your path to improvement. Um, yeah. yeah, but how do, you, how do you get them to come back? How do you keep the, keep the schedule full, I guess? Yeah, Mathnasium is a membership model. So whenever you're enrolling, you're signing up for a set term. I would say most families enroll for a 12-month term to start, and then they end up staying longer just because the missions changed. It went from make sure my kid's not failing to, okay, they're getting C's, but... Now that we've seen the potential in our student, maybe they can be a B student or maybe an A student. And then once they're the A student, typically um, math has different tracks whenever you hit middle school, where either your child can be on the advanced math track where they're working a year ahead of their peers, or they get put on to a standard math track or potentially a remediation math track. And a lot of parents start to want to push for their kid to be in the advanced math class and be able to do AP calculus before they graduate and start getting some math credits for college. So they'll sign up for a year and then typically stay beyond just because they've they found that the program is successful for their students. Um, in terms of kids, Mathnasium does a diagnostic assessment for any child who's going to enroll in our program. And so in doing that, we figure out exactly where math stopped making sense to that child. And we're able to go back to that place and start teaching them from that spot. So it goes from thinking that whenever they're with us, math is going to be the same kind of math that's really hard in school to, oh, hey, I actually know I know this math because that's the point of the assessment. And we're starting to teach them the things that class has moved on, but that kid was still sitting there saying, I don't know how to add fractions. I don't know how to subtract with denominators. Like I know that I constantly get this wrong, but I don't know how to do it right. We go back to that place and we're reteaching them at their pacing. And so it helps them get a lot of quick wins in and build confidence and be like, oh my gosh, for like the last two years, every time decimals pops up on my math test, I cringe because I know that this is a problem I'm gonna get wrong and I don't have to feel that way anymore. On top of that, Mathnasium has a positive reinforcement system. So as students complete work in our learning center facility, they get stamps on a reward card, which they then can redeem for prizes. So we have these awesome prize shelves that are stocked with like candy and goodie and squishmallows and fidget toys and anything that's cool to a kid. If it's cool to a kid, we have it or we can buy it on Amazon for them. So kids get that pretty immediate positive reinforcement that they're not working towards nothing and if grades don't matter to that kid today um, and seeing the A on the report card isn't what's going to matter to that kid, maybe it's that they want a gift card for their Xbox and they know that if they come to Mathnasium 10 or so times, maybe they'll be able to go get a gift card for their Xbox and then it was worth it to them. Switching gears a little bit, uh, from a manager's view, how do you decide what task is something that's worth you personally doing versus something that you should delegate? In my experience, being a part of a family business, we really prioritize dividing and conquering. So my mom's big on education and making sure our instructors are fulfilling the educational requirements of our franchise. My dad's big on finances and leases. Me personally, I'm all things marketing. So I do things from email campaigns to digital media, to community, like getting us signed up for the community events, to negotiating contracts with NBC Universal. If it falls under the general umbrella of marketing, that's me. My brother is human resources. And then we kind of have like an honorary fifth member of our family. His name's Young Gun. Young Gun, he's in charge of building our bench. So we don't take on too much personal responsibility, any single one of us, because we have our buckets of like our scope of practice. And we don't worry about the other stuff. We just kind of know to delegate it to someone else. There's certain things that like we will never do and that we just have to trust a vendor for. So accounting, like we will never worry about accounting because that's way too dangerous when you're looking at numbers and taxes. So our um, accounting is something that we always delegate. And then things like payroll. We have a payroll vendor who worries about like the taxes, if anyone has wage garnishments, that kind of thing. 
Um, that's something that we put on a vendor in that case. Um, but for the most part, if it's in my bucket, I own it myself. And if it's in someone else's bucket, I help give them that like personal accountability. But our team, our team is run really efficiently by people not not doing 20 jobs, like 20 different hats. <laughs> yeah. The piece in there that I, I really like is how you've defined what you're going to say yes to and what you're going to say no to. Cause that, that just makes such a huge difference. It, Cause so many things can creep in, you know, for your to-do list and you've got a pretty good delineation there. Yeah. And when you're a small business owner, it's easy to be a jack of all trades and then figuring out what has the greatest impact on your business overall. And if that's something that if you, give yourself an extra hour for just that one core competency. And then you delegate what would have an hour spent on something else. If you can either delegate it to a vendor, delegate it to another team member. If it's something that just doesn't need to happen, like if it's one of those things that's like a nice to do versus a need to do for your business. Um, we figure that out pretty early on in our franchise structure. And I think that's what's allowed us to grow so quickly um, because we're not getting constantly distracted by little fires in different departments of our company. And then you personally said, uh, your focus primarily on all things marketing. And so Everything. I'm curious for, <laughs> so I'm curious for you, what, um, what is something in particular that you've been trying to improve at, or what is a change that you've made in the last year or so that's had a big impact? My big thing has been this year, I said 2023 was dedicated to the four R's. So our retention, our referrals, our reviews, and our overall reputation and recognition. So in 2023, I was really focused on growing our referral-based business. So making sure that our customers know about our referral program and the fact that it is lucrative. If you refer enough people, you're going to get lots and lots of gift cards from us um, for doing so. Um, being really intentional in proactively asking for reviews online. So I know that's a feature that text request has is to seek out referrals or sorry, blah, seek out reviews on Google. That's something that I push for extensively. Um, and then in terms of recognition and our overall reputation, um, that's stuff like knowing where to apply for employer-based awards. Like how do I apply to be a top workplace? So getting us in all of those contests, the Reader's Choice contest, making sure our name is on the ballot. Um, that has been my central focus for 2023. And it's done wonders in putting our brand out in all the right places and helping grow our, like our lead gen. Um, our lead gen has grown a lot this year off of organic search from the Google reviews. And then referral-based customers, which our referral-based customers convert twice as much as any other lead source. So I've been focusing, I think, in the right areas. And it, whenever you grow your customers, you grow your revenue. That's a given. Um, so it's been it's been a huge impact in 2023. You and your you and your family, your team are are great at what you do, obviously, and are clearly a good example to follow. So if there was uh, maybe one thing you would recommend to other franchisees to do to improve their, their operations or to improve their, their, you know, time boxing or their, their profit margins or what ha whatever, uh, what would it be? Um, honestly, I think you need to receive feedback to start. Um, it's really easy to think about like, what do I want to focus on? Like, where do I want to get better? And sometimes you have to look outside of like your own personal interests and see what is your team recommending to you? What is your advisor recommending to you? So I know in the Mathnasium brand, we have franchise business consultants. Um, I think if I were a franchisee, I'd go to my franchise business consultant first to ask for, where do you think my business is underperforming compared to fellow franchising units? Is there a particular KPI where I'm always bottom tier for that KPI or even like mid or middle lower tier where I have room to improve? And focus on things that you can track through data because what gets measured moves. So you don't wanna just focus strictly on the feel good stuff. You wanna focus on the stuff that you can measure Am I getting better if if I focus on this one area of performance, say lead conversion? If I focus on lead conversion, I take all the best practices from my business consultant on getting better at lead conversion. 
is that KPI ultimately changing? Am I getting a higher conversion percentage? Is there still, like, is there one particular type of lead that I constantly fail to convert at the same percentage as another type of lead? Um, so I would say look to others for where we're outsiders giving you like a good look from, from a higher perspective. Where do they think you need to focus? And then try and measure that through data. That makes perfect sense. Uh, Libby, this has been a great conversation so far. Just one last question before I let you go. I'm a big reader. A lot of business leaders tend to be big readers. And so what's, uh, what's one book you would recommend? I really like Mike why? McCallowitz. Mike McCallowitz is a really great author. He's written a couple different books. My favorite of his is The Pumpkin Plan. Um, if you haven't read The Pumpkin Plan or if you're curious what 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 a high-level overview of it is, it's essentially all about how um, there's two strategies in pumpkin farming. Either you can grow a bunch of average-sized pumpkins or you can be um, a lord of the gourds is what they're called and grow those massive like ton pumpkins um, where they're hundreds of pounds and it's that's a different style of farming. And his whole thing is about how if you're going to do that, you need to cut off the average size pumpkins and just focus on this one thing to really maximize it. Um, so I like that book. It's basically how to grow a colossal business and how to cut off, you know, inferior revenue streams, underperforming employees, that kind of thing, and know how to like analyze that as a business operator. So the pumpkin plan is really amazing. He has a second one, if that's not your speed, called Profit First. Um, Profit First is also a really good book, but they're both by Mike McCallowitz. All right. Well, great recommendations. Uh, and thank you, Libby, so much for your time today. Really appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me.